Be on the book of Romans. This is Sunshine. Oh, Linda, thank you. You're going to do that. Sorry, I interrupted that. This is the Romans Education Part 1, and this is Session 49. Uh, I opened my eyes from the prayer, and it seemed like it was awfully dim in here. It's because those lights weren't shining in my eyes. Um, okay, so we're going to start off on the PowerPoint. Uh, this is the section of Scripture that we're involved in, Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Now, we've been looking at that for a long time. It's all one sentence, but we're focused today on verse 12. And if you'll recall, at the end of the last session, I spent quite a bit of time talking to you about God's cause, what it is that He has determined needs to be done. And uh, we, we also looked at how important we are to what God is doing in the world, what He plans to do in eternity. And, um, and that, that understanding, folks, is the first of three things that I think all of us need to understand in order to get this thing uh, really sitting properly in our mind. I, I know that we didn't answer every question about that, but God is doing something in this world in the dispensation of grace. Not only that, but we are supposed to see that all of the things that are happening to us, not just some of the things, but all of the things that are happening to us are meant for our sonship skills, education, what, whatever, to be put into practice in that, and that is going to train us for what we're going to do in the creature. And so, and, and I, I was giving you an illustration of that last time where I was telling you, sometimes it kind of sneaks up on you, something happens that, you know, you're, you, maybe you weren't anticipating, or it's not enjoyable, or it's a problem, and instead of seeing it as a training ground, it, it kind of sneaks up on you and, you know, other things take control for a while until you finally kind of wrap your mind around it. And, uh, but that's, that's the way that this doctrine is supposed to work. It's supposed to do something effectually in us all the time. And then looking here at verse 12, these are three components that are going to be very important to us. Rejoicing in hope, and, and we're going to talk about that hope. Patient in tribulation why we can be patient in tribulation and what that does for us. And then that fourth one, uh, in, uh, continuing instant, um, third one, I'm sorry, continuing instant in prayer. And we'll, and we'll take a look at all three of those. But you might be saying to yourself, if God is doing something, and He's doing something now in this dispensation of grace, and because He is not doing the material things. Now, Look, I know that that's, without any kind of background, you couldn't just stand up and say that. I do realize that would be a problem in lots of churches to say that. But not only is it true, not only is that what the Scripture is being taught, I mean, that's the doctrine that's being taught to us about that, but it is important for us to understand why. God isn't doing the material things, but rather He's doing the work in our inner man. None of, the, none of the things that have happened to anybody this past week have necessarily been prescribed by your Heavenly Father. Oh, I ran out of gas. That's, that wasn't Him. Uh, I came out and my tire was flat. That wasn't Him. Uh, I woke up and my throat was scratchy. That wasn't Him. He's not doing those things. But if because you live in a fallen world, and we all suffer the sufferings of this present time, even people who don't know the Lord suffer those things. He's not prescribing that, but if that comes your way, then there is something now that we are supposed to see differently about that situation, and something can happen in the midst of those circumstances 
that actually works to conform us to the image of His Son. And that's the goal that He has for us. That's His goal that He has for every believer. Now, unfortunately, not everybody knows what that goal is about. And on the other hand, not everybody cares about that goal. But that's the goal nonetheless, and it doesn't change no matter what. And so, the, but the question is, okay, I get that God's doing something here on this earth, but what is God doing in the heavenly places? Is He doing nothing up there right now? And the answer again is yes, He is doing something in the heavenly places. Now, I have to tell you, this study today is going to be, I hate to say it like this, it's not a break from sonship, but it is necessary foundation work or background work that's going to let you see this thing the way your father sees it. And that's really what's critical for us to do right here. And so if you say, well, what is God doing up there in the heavenly places? Because after all, doesn't Satan control, for the most part, the heavenly places? And the answer is, yes, he does. And, and isn't it his minions, his angels that are in those positions of principalities and powers and, and all of that? And the answer is, yes, it is. And while I think most of us are pretty much aware of that particular part of that issue, I want to make sure that I say this so that if there's any kind of fuzziness in your thinking, we can clear that up. Anybody listening on the DVD will be knowledgeable about what we're about to talk about because this is really now setting the stage for us to see this, the bigger picture of this. So we're pulling back away from this minute detail study to take a look and say, don't forget, this is how all this fits into the bigger picture. And so I want to do a little work here to try to answer the question of what in the world is God doing up there in the heavenly places? Well, the first thing that you need to understand is that when God created the heaven and the earth, He always separates those two out. There's a pattern to that. And I want to show you this pattern because we're supposed to observe something out of that. Look in Genesis 1.1. That's where it all starts. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, the earth is in the midst of all of that. We know that. But he always makes a difference between the heaven and the earth. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, look what he says. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. Did you notice a slight difference there? Yeah, the first one was singular. The second, by, by the time you get chapter 2, it's plural. And look, I don't want to go into this because we don't have a lot of time for that. But when God created the heaven, He created as a single thing. Before you get down over there, what you're going to find out in chapter 1 is God makes a division in that heaven. So there's actually two parts to it now, or two heavens. And so that's why in chapter 2 now, you have the word heavens plural. Because he made a division there. We're going to take a, a closer look at that. But take a look now in verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. The point I'm trying to make is every time he talks, look, you know what we would say? Oh, God created the universe. And we don't ever say anything in addition to that because that includes everything. But when God talks about it, he doesn't talk about the heavens as being the same as what he did with the earth. He separates those out. And because he's, and he's separating them out every time for a reason. Understanding that reason is going to shed light on what we're doing here in Romans 12. Even outside of the creation account, that pattern of separating the heavens and the earth is still in play. Look at, look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. What I'm after here is, even in the book of Exodus, when recalling the creation, there's still the separation of the heaven and the earth. He still sees those as distinct from one another. Not that one contains the other, but he's looking at them separately. Even when it's not the creation account that's being spoken of, 
Take a look at how he does this in Deuteronomy 32. Give ear, O you heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Do you see? That's not talking about the creation at all. But you know what he's doing? He's talking about let, every, let everything in the heavens and everything in the earth listen to what is about to be said. Because there are some beings up there in the heavenly places. Now, let me just give you the rest of these. First Chronicles 16.31 Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let men say among the nations the Lord reigneth. You see, when he's saying that, you notice that this isn't talking about what he created, the heavens and the earth, but when he gives that kind of instruction, it not only goes to the heavens, but it also goes to the earth. Same thing in Nehemiah 6. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone, thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth, and all the things that are therein, the seas, and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. So once again, we have that separation between the heavens and the earth. Psalm 57, 11. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, let thy glory be above all the earth. I, I, I'm just saying... When you read that, people have a tendency to look at that and go, oh, it's that King James Elizabethan English. It's just poetic. And because it's poetic, he's saying, be exalted above the heavens and above all the earth. It's not poetic. It's teaching us something. That is there for a reason, which is why by the... Oh, never mind. Okay. Proverbs 3.19. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding he hath established the heavens. So every way that God talks about that, and this last one in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. You know who he's talking about there? He's talking about the nation of Israel, uh, his own people. But the point I'm trying to make is, everywhere... He mentions this, God never lumps these together into a single term like, well, uh, like the universe. He doesn't use that. Now, does God ever talk about them corporately? Well, He does. And you're familiar with that verse. You may not be able to recall it, but we'll get to it in just a minute. But now, knowing then that the heavens, well, let's just put that up. Knowing that the heavens now are one thing and the earth is another, not just that we live here, but God is doing something different in them. In other words, that's another reason that he would not pull all that together into one. But now we find out that there are actually three heavens. And so here they are. By the way, Paul mentions this over here. When he's talking about himself here in 2 Corinthians, he talks about a time when he was stoned to death in Lystra. And when he was stoned to death, he went up to the third heaven. And he said, I saw things there not lawful for a man to utter. In other words, I can't talk about what, I, what all I saw. But take a look what he says in verse 2. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, rather in the body, I cannot tell, or rather out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, such a one caught up to the third heaven. Now, the third heaven is that place that we normally ascribe as the abode of God. In other words, there is something about that. I know God is omnipresent, but when you're talking about the third heaven, you're actually talking about a very specific place. Now, the way I understand this is that Let's, let's put the earth here. No way that's going to be to scale. And then let's, let's up here, let's put the entire heavens that God created back in Genesis. And so up here, there's a, this up above that creation up here would be the third heaven. That heaven was already there when the, the action of Genesis 1 took place. Because God's not creating the third heaven. It's already in place. The angels are already present. All of that is happening. So the third heaven is out beyond the creation of the, the heavens and the earth. That's what that is. Now, take a look. Now, the first heaven, let's do this. 
I'm going to put another line here because remember I told you that heaven got divided into two different ones. That first heaven is right here. And it literally is the atmosphere around the earth. God calls that a heaven. Let me give you scripture for each one of these. Uh, Genesis 1.20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven. This is the open firmament of the heaven. What do you think of when you hear that word open firmament? If it's open, what do, you, what do you get? If the store is open, what? You can go, yeah, you can, you can get there. Now, the birds are going to fly in the open firmament of the heaven. Can man... Have you, ever, have you ever seen those pictures where the mountains are so high, the birds are actually flying below the mountain? You can actually be standing and looking down on where the birds are flying. They're flying in the open firmament of the heaven. Well, you're standing on a mountain that's reaching up into the open firmament. Can you function up there? Well, you can. You can. It's the open firmament of the heaven. But when you get past that, you're going to now come into the second heaven. And the second heaven is not going to be the open firmament. And in fact, the Bible doesn't use the word, but... Because of the nature of the difference between here and here, we could very well say this is the closed firmament of the heaven. You're not going to function out there like you're going to function in that other one. In fact, when you get out there, you need some things to just be able to survive out there. If you ever notice the astronauts, they never just go out in their blue jeans and t shirt They've got to have oxygen. They've got to have a suit. There's temperature extremes out there and all that kind of business. Now, the, all of this, by the way, when you're talking about first, second, and third, did you notice it's as though the Bible is talking about the earth as the starting point. And that means the first heaven is the nearest, the second is the next closest, the third is the furthest away. We are going to take a look at that third heaven. I'll give you some verses on that. But let me show you the verses on the second heaven first. Genesis 1.14 And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and, and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights the greater light to rule the day, what would that be? The sun. And the lesser light to rule the night, which would be the moon. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give... Now, that's this part up here. So up here, here's what you have. You have the, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And that is all up here in a heaven... But it's certainly not in this heaven. But it's up here in this one. To give light upon the earth, verse 18, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Let me give you one more, and that's in Genesis 22, 17. And this is in conjunction with the promise that God made to Abraham. And I want you to notice how he frames this by, by the words he uses. That in blessing I'll bless thee, and in multiplying I'll multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven. So just because people use the word heaven doesn't mean there's just one heaven. Actually, Paul said, caught up to the third heaven. So we know there are three. Now we know the birds fly in the open firmament of the heaven. That was part of the creation. God put the sun, the moon, and the stars in the other part of that created heaven, but the third heaven, which was already there when that creation took place. So the creation isn't everything. It is just that that God created in which He was going to place mankind. And by the way, there's a reason that God made that. Someone said, well, gosh, He could have made earth and just made man, and, and why didn't He just do that? Why did He make all of that? Why did He do that? Because there is a plan and purpose behind this from the beginning. If you're building a house and you know how many kids you have, then you know what you're thinking? 
I'm going to need more than one bedroom. You're just planning for what you have. That's exactly what God's doing. He's planning in accordance with a purpose that He means to accomplish out there. Now, we refer to this second heaven as outer space. We call it the universe, and God never calls it that. He calls it the heaven. He also calls it, as we learned over in Romans 8, the creature. We talked about that, so I'm not going to go back into that here. But this third heaven now, when we're talking about the abode of God, so this would be, this would be the outer space part. This is the atmosphere part. So when God's talking about this, when He's talking about this third heaven, there are some things that we're going to look at over there because I do, I do believe the Bible teaches us that it was already in place. And if the Bible didn't tell us some things about it, here's what I know. We wouldn't know anything about the third heaven. If that wasn't recorded in the Bible, because there is no man that has ever peered into the third heaven. In fact, people look at, I know what scientists say, they'll look at and they'll say, well, it depends on which scientist you're talking to, but scientists will look at all of that and they would say, oh, the, the universe is never ending but not according to the Bible. The, that was a created thing that certainly doesn't reach everywhere because there are areas that this, he, these heavens don't reach and don't include. Uh, and some things were going on, by the way, before they were created. I, I, I don't think we've ever seen to the outermost part of this, but there's something there that would keep you from looking into the third heaven anyway that the Bible says it's like a molten looking glass or it's like a mirror. And you're not made to be able to see that anyway. Now there's something else about that. We may talk about that a little later on, but I, I'm kind of watching my time here. I need to make sure that we get all of this in. When God created the second heaven, and I want to focus on this for a moment. When God created the second heaven, He did something there. He created a government, and He established that government in that heaven. Now, let me just, let me kind of erase part of this, because I'm going to change, I'm going to change this up. I'm going to do it like this. I won't draw the whole thing. But what God did, I, I, I really need 24 of these all the way around because it's my understanding, and this is where, what we're going to talk about. By the way, this has some relevance to you because this is where you're going to spend your eternity. Those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ that are part of this dispensation of grace, you are going to get a glorified body, you are going to wind up up there, and you are going to go to work up there. You are. And... and, and the, the, this, I, what I'm doing here, it's not going to be 24, but I'm dividing this up because God divided up the entirety of this heaven because this is the open firmament of the heaven. It has a more direct connection to the earth. This does not. And in here, this is where God divided up that created heaven to establish a government. And in that government, here's what you have. Every one of these has, and we'll look up at the scripture for this, a principality, there are powers, thrones, mights, dominions. Those are all, those are all mentioned in your Bible as positions of authority that God established in His government up here in the heavenly places. Now, look, let me just take you forward just for a little bit. Look, because there's something I need to say about that right there. We know that when we start out those four decision-making skills that we learn as sons, the first one is godly wisdom. That's what we're getting right now. The next one is justice. The next one is judgment. No E. And the last one is equity. And those are exactly what we're going to be taught in the book of Romans in that order. And when you get to godly justice, which is the next thing that we're going to get to, especially when you get over to Romans chapter 13, 
Let me just show you something. You got your Bible? Turn over to Romans chapter 13 real quick. Just take a look at this. Now, I'm not going to spend time on it because we are going to study this. But just look at how, because in godly justice, this is going to be the area in which one of those areas of justice, in other words, learning justice from God's point of view, you're going to learn the purpose behind the structure of government. God is, it's, government is a divine institution. I mean by that, God is the creator of government. There are several things that God is the creator of, and we call those the divine institutions. Those divine institutions have a very specific thing that they are supposed to be doing in accordance with why God created them. But look in chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to, the, to, uh, to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom uh, honor. And he goes on. Now we can stop there. What I'm trying to say is, when he gets to Romans 13, he's now going to start telling you about how as a son you are supposed to interact with the government that you are under. And you know what he didn't do? He didn't put any caveat in there to say, if your government is good, or if you like it, or if it's a democracy. Because there's plenty of nations in this world that are not. Plenty. Most. My, my point is this. God created government to do something. Actually, with what we just read, a careful examination of the terminology that's there, in accordance with knowing some things, some of which we're going to learn here today, is going to tell us exactly how a son is going to live in any government on the face of the earth, even if it's a Muslim-controlled country. Because God is asking, it created government, human government. Now, He created His government, but God created human government for a purpose. And if you say, well, why, why, why did God create government? You say, well, you know, it's in there that He created government to punish those that do evil and reward those that do good. But wait a minute. When God created His government up here in the second heaven, all of this being that second heaven, that was before Lucifer rebelled. So God didn't have in mind punishing evil when He created government. So government has another purpose that goes beyond that. Yes, now government will include that. But it doesn't just... By the way, that's why they're the ones that pass the laws and enforce the laws. Because, that, because what they're doing, rather they... And look, you know what's really funny is, almost nobody in government, even though the government in this country at every level, the city of Monahans has a government and they're doing this. The, the, the state of Texas has a government and it's doing this. The United States has a government... And it's doing this one thing that God created government to do. Now, is there lots of things that government does apart from what God created it to do? Man has tacked on a bunch of stuff with government. But I want to tell you this. Every government in the world is doing this one thing. And you can't name one when you find out what it is. 
You won't be able to name a single government that's not doing this. By the way, if it doesn't do this, it won't last. It'll be taken over by someone who is. And it has never failed to be that way. And as long as government does this one thing, and listen, this is great, you can practice your sonship. As long as it does this one thing, no matter what government it is, it doesn't even matter if it's over there in the Middle East where they don't necessarily appreciate Christianity. doesn't matter. You can still practice sonship in your life every day under those governments. So, but again, I'm kind of jumping you over to this next, because this is where we are now, kind of jumping you over to here to say that what we're discussing here is foundational to understanding something that you're going to encounter over there. Because this government setup now, it's, uh, I, hey, we're one nation, but we have 50 states. So you know what? We have a whole different government set up for each one of those areas. That's the way that government was set up as well. And so <clears throat> what Satan does then is he comes along and he has a plan. And his plan is to be the possessor of heaven and earth. That's what he wants to do. Let me just show it to you real quickly. When he says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? By the way, this is Isaiah prophesying about the end of Lucifer, when it all is now going to come to a conclusion. He says, you're fallen from heaven, you're cut down to the ground. Verse 13, for thou hast set in thine heart, and now Isaiah is about to reveal the five-step plan in Satan's plan of evil, with the last one of those being his ultimate goal. Verse 13, for thou hast said in thine heart, number one, I will ascend into heaven. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Number three, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Number four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And that's not clouds on this earth, that's clouds in the heavens. That's where that whole context is. The sides of the north, above the stars of God, all of that. That's up there. And number five, I will be like the Most High. Now what we need to know is, and I know we've covered this before, but in case someone's watching the DVD that didn't see this, what does it mean to be the Most High? Because that's a title. That's a title that means something to God. We look at it like, oh, it's just adjectives that are describing that He's so wonderful. That's not what that is. The Most High is a title, and we learn that in Genesis 14, and he blessed, this is God, this is Abraham now, and he says, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, and here's the definition of the Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. So when, when, when Satan's goal is, I will be like the Most High, you understand, he doesn't say, I'm going to get rid of God, because he knows he can't. He can't get rid of God. But what he can do is usurp or steal the control of heaven and earth. And that's what he's after. Let me give you one more in this same chapter here. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. So when Satan says, I will be like the most high, he's saying, I want to be the possessor of heaven and earth. So what does he do to do that? The very first thing he does is he starts a rebellion among the angels in the second heaven. But he, and, and Revelation says that he drew a third of the angels to rebel with him. But understand this. The third that he got to rebel with him are not just any angel. It's not like he's just walking around talking to angels going, Hey, you want to join my rebellion? He's very specific about who he needs. If you're going to be the possessor of heaven, what angels do you want? You want the ones that are in authority that have the control over, the, over, over all of the government of God because they, can, they control the heaven. 
And so what he does is he gets principalities and powers and thrones and mites and dominions. Those are the ones he's after. I'm going to show you the verses in a moment that the Bible talks about this. Hmm. When Satan's done, he gets every single space in the heaven but one. Only one refuses to. One principality. By the way, that's the head guy in each area. The principality is the top guy. Those that fill the position of powers, they are second in, in line. All of the principalities rebelled except for one. And this is the only one that did not follow Satan's rebellion. You know what he would really like? Get that last one. If he can get that last one... It will be much easier to hold on to control of the heavens. But he's not just after the heavens. What else is he after? And see, and that's why we went to the trouble to say these are two different realms. That's why the Bible talks about them separate. The heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth. These are two separate realms. And so when he get, just because he's got the heavens, does that mean he automatically has the earth? No. This is a different realm. So now he comes to the earth, and there in the Garden of Eden, what does he do? He puts that temptation out there. Adam falls, and Adam, who was supposed to, remember we saw... See, I've been setting you the, uh, up for this for a week now. Remember last week, uh, uh, subdue the earth and have dominion over it? But when Adam falls, he no longer does that. Remember, he was supposed to subdue every living thing that flew in the air, that swam in the sea, or that was on the land. Swim in the wrong part of the sea today and find out where you are in the food chain. Go, go into certain parts of this earth, and you are not at the top. There are things... <laughs> I remember Mark telling me about some guy... I'm not going to get this exactly right. Mark can tell you the exact thing, but this is the gist of it right here. A guy that was a guide that would fly people in up in Alaska and they'd hunt those Kodiak bears, those big bears up there. And uh, he said, when, they when you drop in, they helicopter you in, drop you in, and there you are. And they said, when, they, when you get dropped in, how, how, what was the distance, Mark? Every bear within 30 miles already knows you're there and is deciding what to do about it. That does not sound appealing to me. I'd be going, let me get back in that chopper. But, but you know what? I, I, my only point is, there are predators on this earth. What happens? Adam loses control, but someone else gets it. In fact, there's two names, and I didn't give you the verses on it, but you'll know them when I tell you. Because of his control in the heavenly places, Satan earns this name, the prince of the power of the air. When he gains control of the earth, Jesus calls him by a different name in, a, in accordance with that realm. And he calls him the prince of this world. And there's the two names that tells you that even though Satan has kind of stolen the possession of heaven and earth, he is controlling the heaven and the earth. And he's got these two names that indicate that. And if he can solid... And here's what... Look, this whole thing has started... Oh, okay, look, let me, uh, I got a minute. Do you remember... Uh, look, someone says it like this. This is the best way to say it. Doesn't God know everything? Yep. Didn't he know everything that was going to happen before it happened? Yep. Didn't he know Satan was going to rebel? Yep then why, didn't he, why did he create him in the first place? Or why didn't he create him and then forever how long he was here, fine, but before he rebels, why didn't he throw him in the lake of fire then? Why does he let him do this? There is a purpose behind that. It's not that God can't do it. It's that there is a necessary purpose behind this. Did God ordain for Satan to rebel? Did God say, I'm going to create a rebellious angel? That's going to be evil. No, God didn't do that. But He did give these angels an ability to make decisions. And, we, and by the way, 
if, if, if you love God, is it because He makes you or because you choose to? Which brings Him more glory? Choosing. When someone chooses, you do not, I mean, when our kids are little and growing up, we want them to love us, but do we want them to love us because we're going to wear them out if they don't? Or do we want them to love us because they really love us in their heart? See, that's the thing that every parent is after. Well, so, <coughs> when, when Satan rebels in the heavens and he gets control, and then he, rebel, he, 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 he uh, gets Adam to rebel on the earth, he becomes the prince of this world. Everything he is doing from that point on is to solidify his hold on the heaven and the earth. And if he can get the whole of the heaven, the way I understand this, if he could get the whole of the heaven, and this is too, too big a topic to discuss in detail now, but there is something that is going to be done by us when we get up there in our glorified bodies in which all the things in heaven and all the things in earth are going to be brought together, I'm quoting the verse here, into one under Jesus Christ. That Putting that all together as one entity is kind of what solidifies all of that. And if Satan could get control of the whole heavens and get control of the earth and put those together, you have no idea how hard it would be to reconcile those back away from him. So we, he, that's what he's trying to do. And what is God trying to do? In his, and I say trying to do, I don't mean he's trying but he can't get it done. God has chosen to repossess the heavenly places back to himself and to repossess the earth back to himself, but he has not chosen to do it by his omnipotent power. He has chosen to do it using two weak, fragile entities. For the earth, he has chosen the nation of Israel to reconcile the whole earth back to himself. Has that been an ordeal? He created them. He brought them into existence. He gave them a land. He performed all those miracles on their behalf. And what did they do? Worshipped other gods. Broke his laws. Rebelled against him. In the temple, that was they lost the word. They lost the Old Testament scriptures. And one day when they're doing a clean up, somebody finds the book containing the Old Testament scriptures and they bring it to the king and they go, what is this? What is this? Now see, that's just almost beyond belief, isn't it? And then the king starts to read it and he goes, oh my goodness, this must be the word of the Lord. How far are you from God when you've turned His temple into a house of prostitution and it's been that way so long that when they, for all intents and purposes, let's call it, they find a Bible, nobody knows what that is. Has that been an ordeal? Yes. But you know what God says? Sure, I can do this. And I can repossess the earth, Satan, and all of his cohorts will be in the lake of fire. I can end it all. But see, that's the boast that Satan makes. Oh yeah, you're bigger and tougher than everybody, but the truth is, people would rather live in my world than your world, God. That's what he, that's his boast. And you know what God is saying? I don't have to use my omnipotent power. I will show you that not only... Again, I set you up last week on this. I'm the only one qualified to be the possessor of heaven and earth. I'm the only one worthy to be heaven and earth. And nobody can do with the creation what I can do. And I don't have to intervene. Here it comes. Here it comes. I don't have to miraculously intervene in the physical circumstances to get it to turn out my way. Are you listening to me? I don't have to miraculously intervene in the physical circumstances that are going on in order for this to happen. You know what that would be like? 
Yeah, I don't have to override you. I can make this happen and we'll all play by the same rules and we'll see who deserves to be the possessor of heaven and earth. And the Bible says at the end of that, every mouth will be shut and even Satan and his cohorts will have to admit that he alone is worthy to be the possessor of heaven and earth. He alone is worthy to be God. That's the cause that your father has invested in. Now, now let me tie this up because I'm running out of time here. We've got we to gotta stop. Uh, so with, uh, let me just make sure I'm going to get to the end of this here. Oh, Lord, we're not very far along, are we? Okay, let me talk to you about these. Why, why I think these are 24 and all, and all but one followed Satan's rebellion. So let's, let's, let's start with this. By the way, how much control does Satan have over the heavenly places? Well, almost total control. Isn't it true, though, someone would argue right here, I know someone that is at home watching this on their DVD or they're watching online, they're saying, but wait, wasn't Satan defeated right here at the cross? I thought Satan was defeated at the cross. And indeed, that defeat was procured right there at the cross. But let me ask you, has God repossessed the earth back to himself yet? No. So what's going on with that? Before he does that, there's something he has to do to allow for the repossession of the heavens. Because Israel, in their program, is only promised a kingdom on this earth. If you repossess the earth back to yourself, but all of the heaven belongs to Lucifer, what good is that? He's, he is the creator of heaven and earth, not just earth. It's all going to be His. And folks, that's where we come in. The body of Christ are the ones being prepared to reconcile the heavenly places back to Him. So He's got two realms, two programs, and just so you've got Israel here, you have the body of Christ, the church, the body of Christ. Oh, I had that right. The church, the body of Christ here, those two together. And here's what God is saying. I'm not going to miraculously intervene in what's going on with us in order to get what I'm trying to get done accomplished. But it will be done because of something God is doing that Satan can't do. And what is that? Conform you to the image of his son, not by the snapping of his fingers or the waving of his wand but through the effectual working of His Word, you get conformed to the image of His Son and you begin to, see this is so old, it's funny, think like He does, do things His way, so that when you get up there, you will labor with Him in what He's doing. This is that drum, I keep beating that drum, but it's all tied into that. Do you, do you see? Are you starting to see how this whole thing ties together here? So let me give this to, real quickly to you, Colossians 2. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now look what follows. And having spoiled principalities and powers. That's those guys up there. He made a show of them openly, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. In what? Go back to the end of verse 14. Nailing it to his cross, and he spoiled those principalities of powers by triumphing over them in what he accomplished on the cross. Because the cross is what made all of that possible. All right, now real quickly, according to my deal, I have 38 seconds left, so here we go. We might as well not even do this. We might as well just wait and come back. But what I want to do is I want to take you next. And I want to show you, first of all, how all of these rebelled but one. And then I want to show you where I get the idea. Because people have... Uh, th this is the question I get asked now. Where do you get that thing about 24 divisions of the government up there? Where does that come from? 
So I'll show you how I get that, and then we'll talk about what that means to us all.